All right. Well, good morning, everybody. This is Joe Mo Stewart and crew here at the Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation. It is Tuesday, February 27th, just after 8 o'clock in the a.m. And we're here for this week's Energy for All Alaska Task Force. Guests here in the room, we have, of course, our intrepid Mr. Roger Burgraff, uh, you know, award-winning community volunteer. We have Mr. Ken Hall. Uh, we also have Miss Katie Yarrow. Good morning, as well as my staff, Miss Killian Felt. And an award-winning volunteer. And there we go. Oh, <laughs> volunteers <laughs> of the year. Here we go. <laughs> and our guest this morning is Mr. Dan Smith with the USDA uh, Rural Development. Uh, here to give us a briefing on a cool funding opportunity, uh, really actually rather extraordinary funding opportunity for local businesses. And so without further ado, Mr. Smith, I'll allow you to introduce yourself and the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Jomo. Good morning, everyone. Um, as he said, I'm Dan Smith. I'm the state energy coordinator for USDA Rural Development. Um, we do more than just grow corn. Um, my my backstory, you know, my my origin is, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, um, and I moved here because I love winter, um, and I've been enjoying it ever since. Actually, coming up on just about ten years as of tomorrow, I've been here. Um, I got a background in civil engineering, um, and I used to work for the state of Alaska. I worked for the nonprofit sector for a while. Um, and then the Department of Energy scooped me up, and after a few years of doing that, USDA scooped me up for. For even more fun. Um, uh, so anyway, I'm here to talk about some of the funding opportunities we have for businesses um, and some of our business programs. Um, USDA Rural Development does a lot. Um, I feel like I put this slide together as kind of the uh, disclaimer you hear uh, at the end of medicine commercials where it's like, ask your doctor and they rattle off all the side effects just to legally say they told you about it, but you're not actually supposed to hear about it. So we do a lot. Um, I like to say we have everything, you know, we, I call ourselves the village in a box, everything you would need from broadband, water, wastewater, sanitation services, clinics, schools, transportation, energy, of course, housing, um, you name it, we do it in one way or another. Um, so to tap into that multitude of programs, what you need to do first is figure out what your organization is, whether it's a business, for-profit, nonprofit, 501c12 cooperative, um, are you a tribal entity, municipal, uh, regional government, you know, and then figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish and what funding mechanisms you could kind of quilt together or stitch together to achieve it you know maybe it's part grant part self-finance you get a little bit of a loan to fill in some of the gaps um you know maybe if you are a municipality maybe you could do some bonding um i know that's uh, a little bit easier said than done but you know all those mechanisms just figure out the patchwork of funding um first one up and this is what i get paid to talk about is reap the rural energy for america program oh and Mr. um Smith if you don't mind. Yes. So yeah, uh, this is the one I advertised big for everybody, just so you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, and just a reminder yeah. to the gang, uh, again, I'm still without a second monitor. I, I, I'm not actually looking at the participant list. I'm not actually following the chat. So as we move through this presentation, remember it is for you. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, please just feel free to take yourself off mute and fire away. Uh, we, we usually use a bit of a conversational format, Mr. Smith. Oh, perfect. I love that. All right. Um, Thanks, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so going back to March of uh, last year, um, you know, the Biden administration announced one point, a little over a billion dollars for this program. Uh, the Alaska allocation uh, has over the last several quarters of this, you know, round of funding, it's been a little over a, uh, about a million and a quarter, uh, 1.25 million per quarter. Um and, you know, with that number in mind, I will say um, we have not come close to hitting that number. Um, you know, the June applications of last year, June of last year, we did about 40 percent of that. The September um, applications from 930 of last year, um, we just wrapped up. There was only 16 percent of that one point two five million. Um, you know, we're still racking and stacking from the December quarter that just closed. That was right around 45% of our allocation. Um, and, you know, so we're we're a little bit behind and I'm a little bit nervous that 
the national office might scoop up some of that money and redirect it towards uh, Kentucky or Montana or somewhere. Um, but anyway, that's the, the, you know, the funding that's available. Um, these grants, they can cover up to 50% of the total pro eligible project costs. So if you've been thinking about getting a new boiler for your business, or maybe you need some new windows, um, you know, or you've been thinking about doing like some solar panels and a battery, which we actually have done several of in Fairbanks, um, then we can pay up to half of the cost um, to a certain cap. There are caps, uh, but I'll get into that later. Um, and it's important to note, this is a reimbursable basis. Uh, so let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar solar project you want to do, you are going to have to pay for it up front, and then we'll reimburse you half of the cost. So using that hundred thousand dollar example, if you pay for the hundred thousand dollars for the solar panels, you do the paperwork, get it built, we'll reimburse your business fifty thousand dollars using that example. Um, we also have loan guarantees. Dan. Yeah. So sorry, yeah. I have two questions real quick. So of course. Is is the reimbursement approved ahead of time? So when they're fronting the money, they already know that that reimbursement is coming? Um, yes and no. Um, so what the, the way the process works is you fill out your application. So let's, let's use the upcoming deadline of March. March 31st is the upcoming deadline. Uh, let's say you fill out your application, you get everything in, um, you send everything to me, I look it over and I notice, oh, you're missing like one little document, you know, you forgot to check a box. So I send it back to you, you check the box two days later. Okay. Now we have everything. I'll send you a complete application letter. And when you get that letter, it'll have the date you have a complete application. And let's say you got March 29th. So you're under the deadline that March 29th, that's on your complete application letter, that's the date you can start incurring expenses that will be eligible for reimbursement without guarantee of reimbursement. Now, we mm -hmm. are a little bit behind. Um, you know, I just came on about seven months ago, so I've been helping alleviate some of the bottleneck, um, but we are still a little bit behind. Uh, so we're anticipating it'll probably be about three months from that date before you actually know the money has been obligated to you. Um, and that's, you know, that that's about, you know, what we've been seeing for the last uh, couple of grant cycles. Um, and then as far as actually getting the money out the door. So once it's obligated and the business knows the money's coming, um, after that's done, um, you know, we'll have to once the project is done and you'll have two years to complete the construction um, from the time that the grant award is in place. Um, from the time that the funding is obligated, you'll have two years to complete the construction. And once you complete the construction, uh, submit us your invoices, you know, all the, everything showing that, yep, that's built. Um, you know, we may be able to come out and do a site visit if we have time, um, but otherwise we'll just ask for pictures you know, showing that, yep, the solar panels are in place or yes, here's a before and after of our window replacement, you know, so the windows have been actually replaced, um, you know, just to verify, yes, taxpayer dollars were used for what they were intended for. Um, and um, once that's done, uh, we'll start processing the disbursement. And I believe we try to do it within seven to 10 business days. Okay. And how does the department define a small business? So that, all right, um, it's dependent on your NAICS code. The rural part is easy for Alaska, just not Anchorage. Um, so Fairbanks <laughs> is definitely eligible. Um, the, the small business part, most businesses are eligible. But if you have any doubt, if you look up the Small Business Administration NAICS codes, um, I have a table um, and maybe I can pull it up here real quick. Um, I actually sent a, a link out to my investors to the U.S. or to the SBA website. Yeah. yeah, and this is, I just have this saved on my uh, my desktop just as a quick reference so I don't have to look it up every time. Uh, this was updated in March of last year. Um, they may have rolled out another one. I don't think it would have any major changes. Um, 
but it's standard size and millions of dollars or size of employees. It's totally dependent on, you know, what your NAICS code is. So whatever you're registered to do business as, um, and it varies depending on the industry, you know, like electric power distribution, you know, that's 1,100 versus if you're in a water supply or a treatment facility, that's, you know, 35, 41 million dollars. Oh, natural gas distribution. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a thousand employees. <laughs> we're, we're more than small. Real right? small. <laughs> yeah. I'm not um, worried about me. I'm worried about our customers. Yes. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, yeah. Dan. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, if we get to that, I just want to see your. Uh, is, there that we can look, is there a way we can get to this so we can have it to look it up or just look it up online um, or? Yeah, I, I found this just by, uh, you know, exercising my Google Foo, um, but I can send this table out to Jomo uh, for distribution after the fact, if that would help. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And actually, yeah. Dan, I thought I saw the link to it higher up in the, like on the first page. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. Here you, you go. Could, uh, maybe just cut and paste into the chat. Yeah. One second. I will say, uh, while we have this moment, that sounds a bit like, okay, you mentioned obligation of funds. Uh, I believe that's the way the old AHFC program would work. Once your application was accepted, they would get those funds and they would put them in a shoebox. Yeah. In expectation of you doing the work. Um, so, the, you know, they, and in fact, I, I want to say under the old AHFC program, the maximum reimbursable amount when they revised it was $20,000, they would literally take $20,000, put it in a shoebox, so that if you did the work and you qualified for that full $20,000 amount, you, you know that it would be there for you. Um, and then they would return it to the pot if you either didn't do the work or your work came in under. But again, they they wanted to make sure that having yeah. made a promise, they could keep the So promise. it is earmarked even if it's such not, earmarked, yes. Even if it's not fully correct. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you pointed that out, Jomo, because that you know these are the limits I mentioned. Um, you know, five hundred thousand up to five hundred thousand for energy efficiency, and up to a million for renewable energy systems. And this is just the grant portion. Um, you know, so I mentioned if it's a fifty percent cost, and let's say you have a project where you want to do a two million dollar solar array. That's a big solar array. Um, we would be able to pay up to a million dollars of that. Um, you know, that's the cap. Or let's say you wanted to get even bigger with it, make it a three three million dollar project. You're more than welcome to do that. Um, but we we're gonna run up against our cap of one million dollars. Um, and they're going across six quarterly cycles up until the end of this year. Um, you know, it's been going. Um, and after after September of 2024, this current funding structure is going to run out. This program will still likely be around. We just don't know what it's going to look like after that point. Um, historically, this I mean, this program has been around for you know 10 years at least. Historically, it's been 25% grants as opposed to 50% grants. Um, so it might go back to that, you know, and then of course we've got an election year coming up so who knows what's going to happen then um <clears throat> and um you know the the grant caps could change as well um it could go up down um you know it, who knows um but point is the way it's structured right now um it's 50 percent, and it's going on a quarterly basis um we've got oops Sorry, I'm jumping around. Um, the next deadline, like I said, is March 31st. Um, so if you have the bits and pieces you need for these grants, um, start pulling it together and get it sent in. The sooner you can get it in, the sooner I can take a look at it and tell you what we're missing, if anything. Um, you know, because the goal is, this is different than other grant programs you might have encountered. Um, you know, usually when it's a grant program, or a grant application, you get everything you have, you package it up, you send it off and just pray that you got everything. Um, you know, for this program, you send us what you have. Um, 
And if it's substantial enough for us to make a file, like, you know, there's three core forms. I'm going to show you one of them here in a second um, that you have to send us. And if you send us that and like a technical document with what you're proposing, that's generally enough for us to start making a file internally. And that's kind of informally, we'll just kind of hold your hand a little bit and make sure, oh, did you remember this? So we need this piece and can you send us that? And um, the important part is if you're able to send us all those little bits and pieces by the quarterly deadline, then we can consider your application complete. You know, so we're, we're pretty relaxed as far as government programs go. Um, you know, we're here to, you know, help small businesses succeed uh, and tap into all the amazing technology coming out these days. <clears throat> um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is, is Lisa Barrett. And yeah, well, I'll say it's more of a comment. I wasn't quite sure when this might be appropriate to stick it in. I work with Information Insights and I'm working with uh, Jamie and Lizzie there with the REAP tag, um, Information Insights, for those who don't know, um, one, what's called REAP tag, which is a technical assistance grant to help folks with this process. And yeah. so I just wanted to add, I'm going to add, um, Jamie asked me to add this um, link into the chat here and maybe Jomo can also share it out so that, you know, small businesses and others that are interested um, and want to get some assistance from the technical assistance uh, team um, can find the links at this, um, this link that I'm going to stick in the chat. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Well, that's perfect. Thanks, yeah, thank Lisa. you, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, and Ms. Nelica had I, noted... I really want to highlight that. Oh, Ms. Nelica had noted that there was local assistance, but she just hadn't mentioned who it was. So thanks a million, Lisa. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Lisa. And I, I really want to highlight that. Um, one of the pieces that we need, so there are um, two types of grants here. There's the energy efficiency grants and the renewable energy grants. For the energy efficiency grants, you need to have an energy audit. That's that's mandatory. Um, we won't fund you if you don't have an energy audit. And even if you get an energy audit and you decide not to go for a REAP grant, they're very useful because uh, you get an expert in there to come in and kick the tires of all your mechanical systems and you know point a radar gun or a thermal gun at your windows and see how much heat you're losing. They're pretty useful, uh, especially if your building is 20 years or older. Um, you know, they, they outline all the uh, payback periods, what the capital cost of each option would be, like how much is it going to cost you for insulation, what's the payback period, all that fun stuff. Um, and Information Insights is one of our technical assistance partners uh, through the REAP TAG program. You know, so REAP is Rural Energy for America program, and TAG is Technical Assistance Grants. Um, last year, we did one of those grants to Information Insights, um, as well as we split it with um, Rural Cap. Rural Cap's one of our other partners. Um, and they're able to get an energy audit out their auditor for you um, at a reduced cost. Um, so that helps streamline the process a little bit. Um, this is, um, that, oh, this no. is Tanya over at Morris Thompson Center. And I actually have a commercial energy auditor from Department of Energy coming next month to do some work. So would I be able to use that if, say, oh, yeah. this looked for? Okay, cool. I mean, different agencies have different requirements, and sometimes you end up rolling your eyes at your internal stuff. So figure it's worth my time to ask. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can find it. We it, And it's written into our regulations oh, exactly even better. Yeah. what we require. Um, no, I'm not going to search that term. Um, uh, let's see. All right. Type some I will in. say, or I'm going to ask, in having discussions with uh, Mindy O'Neill over Coal Climate Housing Research Center. So again, when we, when the state was operating the Home Energy Retrofit and Rebate Program, it also yeah. hinged on getting an energy audit. Actually, you needed two of them. Uh, you needed one yeah. on the front end to figure out what your star rating was, and then you needed one on the back end to know what the improvement in your star rating was. S coming out of the chute, we found that there, there weren't very many energy auditors in the community. In fact, at the time, yeah. my recollection is there were only two. 
Um, and it took yeah. some time to ramp up that capability. Well, it's been over a decade and there's been quite a bit of demob. In fact, there's been a strong demob in that sector. I guess what I'm wondering yeah. is, and do we have the energy auditors? That's it's it's a bottleneck for sure. Um, there's a couple guys who've been consistently doing it. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, it is just kind of a shortcoming and it, it's tough to find someone qualified. And so right here, you know, these are our regulations, section 4280 dash or 4280.103. That's the definitions. Um, if the total project cost is going to be less than $80,000, we don't have to go for a full audit. It can just be what's called an assessment. And an energy assessor is just a qualified consultant who's had at least three years of experience and completed at least five energy assessments or similar energy audits um, in the last, you know, last three years. Uh, so if you've got a licensed electrical or mechanical engineer, um, they should be able to do the calculations um, and if they're licensed, they can just put their Alaska license, um, stamp of approval on it. And that, again, this is for energy efficiency projects under 80,000. Um, if it's over 80,000, it's got to be a full energy audit. Um, and, um, you know, so full energy audit, you have to have the savings, um, dollars per year, simple payback, the methodology, you know, it's a little more in depth, goes a little bit more into the theory. Um, and it says that you have to be done by a supervising energy auditor, which is defined right down here. This is our next thing. Again, it could be um, a licensed engineer um, who again has done similar audits or similar calculations. Um, or again, there's Certified Energy Auditor, Certified Energy Manager uh, by the Association of Energy Engineers. Um, and yeah, like Lisa said in the chat, it is still a bottleneck that we're struggling with. Um, we're doing the best we can to alleviate it, um, but hopefully shedding some light on the exact definitions in our regulations um, might help encourage some of the creative thinking in the room uh, you know, to, to help us help you kind of thing. Um, you know, and then with that, you know, it comes down to, um, you know, I don't know if anyone was listening to the radio on Friday, um, but I mentioned it then and I'll mention it now. Um, just show us the math. Um, that's that's what it comes down to. Um, if you can get one of these assessments or energy audits done and it shows the math, um, we can work with you. Um, and if, if we're missing more or if we need more, we'll let you know. Because like I said, this grant program, it's as far as federal grant programs go, it's a little more flexible. We're not just going to say, no, you're rejected and, you know, have a nice day. Um, we'll be like, well, we want to fund you, but we need a little bit more information here. Can you help us out? Um, you know, because like I said, we've got that money. We're trying to spend it before it gets scooped back to like Tennessee or something. Um, you know, we've got the need here. We all know it. So. Um, and we're, uh, back to the, I guess, on a final note on this one. So, like, the, so HFC, they still have their ACWARM system, which I, you know, was a, basically a software suite at the time. The big bottleneck, yeah. and again, the the rub on this was that that was residential. It was for residential, you know, for homes. Um, so essentially smaller mm -hmm. scale, and it mostly involved. Like one of the big bottlenecks was actually just the equipment. You know, they would put a, it was a blower door test is really what it was. Um, so getting the fans was one of the bottlenecks. This is, this is a bit grander of scale, but I'm assuming that uh, I would think that Information Insights is trying to put together that list of, you know, who can perform this work, whether in town or out, because everything hinges on it. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they've got agreements in place. Um, and I, we're working to try and alleviate that bottleneck on our ends from the paperwork side. Uh, so they can get even more contracts in place. I think there are a few folks um, that they're wanting to contract with. We just need to finish the paperwork, um, which I apologize we're behind on. Um, we're the government. There's mountains of paperwork. If you think it's bad on your side, oh, it's even worse for us. Um, yeah. 
Um, so we also are able to use this program to do loans, uh, guaranteed loans. Um, they haven't really been done because there's so many more other loan opportunities out there. Um, but it is if you have a bigger project um, and you're having trouble uh, getting a, um, a loan from a bank, uh, we could use this program to guarantee that loan up to 80% of that loan. Um, and that would, you know, maybe help grease the wheels a little bit with the lenders. Um, if you're interested in that, I can talk, I can dig up more and we can, you know, have a sidebar conversation about it. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to move on, uh, cause we've got a couple case studies here. Um, so Bear Creek Winery down in Homer, um, they used this and, you know, I have it called out here as 25%, uh, cause this was before the Inflation Reduction Act came out. That's the current method of funding for this um and you know back in the pre-inflation reduction act days this was a 25 percent grant um but they were still able to save roughly twelve thousand dollars per year on their energy bill um and you know it worked the solar panels worked out perfectly for bear creek winery um you know just because of their energy use profile you know it's it's a winery so they're going to need higher refrigeration um, demands in summer when, and that's when the sun is shining. Um, and cause it's down in Homer, uh, they also have a pretty solid uh, tourist industry. Um, and so that's when they get a lot more visitors coming through um, a lot more use, um, you know, so it, it just lined up perfectly uh, with what their use case was. And we were able to help, you know, offset, you know, $12,000 out of their annual expenses. Question, Dan. Um, yeah. Doug Isaacson, Mentor Development. So on the loan guarantee program, back in the days when I was a mortgage uh, broker, we used the RD guaranteed program for residential uh, mortgages. Is that program or is do you have an offshoot that also guarantees loans to small businesses? Uh, commercial loans, whether it might be acquisitions, yes. equipment, or acquisitions. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. We we still have those. Um, I didn't have a slide here for it. Um, but yeah. So the, this loan is just for energy expenditures. Uh, but we do have the business and industry loans still. Uh, those are still around. Um, I was actually talking to a gentleman uh, from Barrow yesterday about it. Um. And it, I, I think it still work, functions the same way it did back in the day, um, where you would talk with uh, your lender, uh, whoever you're doing your business banking with, um, and just say, hey, we want a business loan. We need this piece of equipment. It's going to cost this much. Um, and I would encourage you, before you do that, to reach out to us um, and talk with us about the the business and the B&I loans, they're called. Uh, the B and I guaranteed loans, um, and that way you can go to the bank and say, "Hey, I talked to USDA about getting a B and I loan um, or a B and I guaranteed loan." Uh, you know, so that way they can kind of de-risk it a little bit on their side. Um, you know, so rather than just, "Oh, who's this guy off the street wanting to buy you know a hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment?" They're like, "Oh, I talk to USDA. They've done their homework. They know what they're after." So. The BNI uh, guaranteed program is uh, on your website. Uh, yes, it is. Let me see if I can navigate to it. Um, bear with me. The internet's slow. Okay. <laughs> so of course I have the the REAP program as my bookmark. Um, but if you go over here to USDA Rural Development, I'll bring us back to the home page so you can get there. Um, give it a second. So it'll be down here. You go down to businesses. Um, and you click on one of these things. I think they all go to the same place or roughly the same place. Um, you know, this popped up right here, business and industry loan guarantees. Um, now over here on the left, these are all the programs we have. Um, we've got housing, telecommunications, water and environmental. That's usually more for municipalities and tribes. Um, you know, but our business programs right here, um, we've got a lot. Um, 
you know, in B and I loans, um, energy programs, that's, you know, we have, uh, you know, both the REAP grants that I talked about, um, Lisa might be familiar with the RITA grants, which are rural energy development assistance grants. Um, we had some, we actually have a couple of those active again with information insights. Um, we've got food supply guaranteed, uh, meat and poultry processing grants, um, all kinds of fun stuff, rural business investment programs. And this one is, I think, more geared towards uh, some of the soft costs. Um, you know, again, these are programs that I'm not super keyed into. I'm, I'm an energy guy. Um, and I, I've been drinking from the fire hose trying to learn about the business side of things. Um, and there's a couple down here, you know, red leg, I got a slide on that. I want to pull up here pretty quick, um, as well as the rural business development grants. So those are a couple good ones I want to highlight. Thank you. And I'm going to zip through here. Um, actually, before we leave REAP, um, I just want to highlight this case study here. Um, this is a busy slide, but we got a lot of great pictures out of it. It, it was for a fishing boat. Um, and this one in particular, uh, they were doing a hydraulic pump and a refrigerated seawater system. But we have had other fishing boats where they don't do any of this stuff and they still qualify for energy, energy efficiency. What they do is they expand their fish hold. So they just get a bigger box for fish. It's got nothing to do with electricity, nothing to do with heating, just a bigger box. Um, but because they have a bigger box, that means they can hold more fish per trip out to the fishing grounds. So that means they're making less trips back and forth to the processor. That means they're using less energy uh, and therefore an energy efficiency project. So I just wanted to highlight that because it really shows we can get creative with what we call energy efficiency. You just got to show us the math. That's what it comes down to. Um, so these are you know, the other programs we have. Um, and I think they're all open right now. Um, uh, the RBDG, the Rural Business Development Grant. Um, it's technically open right now, uh, but I think it closes tomorrow. Um, yeah, it closes tomorrow. Uh, but this one, this is a grant program that's not for businesses, but it's supposed to help businesses. And what I mean by that is to access this one, like let's say a tribe wanted to build a greenhouse. Uh, the tribe would apply for funding to build that greenhouse, like a hydroponics facility, high tunnel, actual greenhouse, you know, you name it. Um, the tribe would get the award. They would build the greenhouse. Um, and then once the greenhouse is built, the tribe would contract out or set up a, a lease agreement to a for-profit business to operate the greenhouse. Um, and so this this whole program is designed for a community like Fairbanks. So Fairbanks or FEDC could, I, th I think FEDC could apply as a nonprofit, um, could apply to this program to build things that would benefit and make the community more attractive to conduct business in. You know, on the coast, we've um, we've talked to cities about getting a new, new port or a new wharf upgrade. Um, you know, I just used the greenhouse example, um, or if you needed to build a new multi-purpose facility uh, where there'd be a couple for-profit businesses operating out of, that would be something to do with it. Um, you know, th this program is, you know, it's competed nationally. We're still waiting for Congress to get the budget passed, uh, but we're anticipating 37 million to be available. Um, Red Leg is another one, and this one is weird. It's for community facilities, and it has to go through a utility. And the reasoning there is that if you're building a new facility, that's going to be another electric customer. Um, and so that's what the incentive is for the electric utility uh, to sign up for it. Um, and I'll, I'll skip through this, and then we can get back to the, the, the REAP grants if we need to. Um, but this is the last one I want to uh, mention. Uh, the value added producer grant. Uh, and this one, you know, I'll start off with a case study again. Um, Barnacle Seafoods, uh, I think they're out of Juneau. 
Um, but they are a three-time recipient of the value added producer grants. Um, they, you know, this grant program is designed to help uh, an agricultural producer um, market their product, um, expand the market, um, you know, create new products, uh, you know, add value to whatever their agricultural product is. Um, you know, and back in FY18, uh, they started off with like just basic business planning. Um, you know, they had all these ideas they wanted to do with their kelp, um, kelp processing. Um, but we told them, you know, just apply for the one thing, just get your business up and going, and then you can come back, uh, for round two. Um, and they came back for round two and even round three. Um, and as of their last, um, uh, grant report, uh, they mentioned that they added $750,000 during, um, their revenue during the grant period, um, which was FY22 through FY24, which we're still in. Um, so that was far and away a great success story. Um, you know, we're accepting applications for this program until April 16th. Um, and again, we're waiting on Congress to pass the budget, but we're anticipating $31 million um, on a national wide basis or on a nationwide basis. Um, so if you do compete, um, it'll, it'll be national. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about agricultural producers um, and I wish I pulled up a slide with examples, but we have pretty broad definitions of what's considered agricultural product. Um, forestry is considered agricultural product. It's it's anything you can grow or harvest, except no fit, uh, no pets, no horses, and no marijuana. Um, yeah, uh, it's still federally illegal. Um, but yeah, like everything from like if you wanted to do bone meal from fish processing, um, or you know, set up a, a slaughterhouse for, you know, helping hunters with their moose. Um, uh, or even forestry residue. Um, I think we actually had uh, Young's Mill down in uh, Toke. Um, I think they got one of these grants one year. Um, and they got a new um, wood chipper or something uh, to take their, their off cuts or the little bits and pieces that they weren't able to use. And they got a wood chipper. Um, and they were able to sell the wood chips for, I forgot exactly what they were doing, like playground or mulch, or I think they might be selling some of the wood chips down to Mentasta for their heating. Um, but, you know, the point is we can get pretty, uh, you know, the, the definition of agricultural product is pretty broad. It's not just corn and soybeans. Um, um, yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, here's my contact information. If you want to ask me specific questions, feel free to give me a call, heckle me, um, tell me I'm doing a good job, bad job, uh, or just talk about the weather. So I do have a question regarding tanneries. Someone yeah. just texted me to ask if, if tanneries would qualify. Sounds like they would. For value-added producer grants? Yes. Ooh, um, well, again, you've harvested the maybe. moose. You said butchering it. Yeah, maybe. So I, I had, um, we had an inquiry from a fish processor come in and it turned out the fish processor was not eligible because of how they, you know, it's, so it's value added producer grants. Um, so it's, we have pretty broad definitions for agricultural product. So Tanning moose hide, yeah, that would be value. That would be a product, an agricultural product. Now, figuring out how you qualify as a producer, that's the tough part. Um, and we really get into splitting hairs. So the example of the fishery, the fish processor, the fish processor, it started off as, um, you know, this husband and wife couple, uh, they ran a fishing boat and they did their own fish processing. Um, but then they got so good with it um, 
they started processing more fish um, and they started buying fish from other fishermen and the the feedstock coming into their processing plant was more more than half of the fish coming into their processing plant was procured from other people um and so they were no longer an agricultural producer they were an agricultural processor mm -hmm. and so that your moose tan moose hide tanning um that's where we might run into hiccups if the gentleman was tanning his own moose hides or his own caribou hides or own skins that he himself hunted or she herself hunted, um, that would be a value added product. Um, you know, otherwise it comes into agricultural processing, um, you know, which is an agricultural business. Um, and I think being an agricultural business, business that would still qualify under the definitions of REAP. Um, so the REAP grants are for agricultural producers. Oh, wait, nope. I'll have to double check on that one. Okay. In, speaking um, of which, I hope that answers your question in a roundabout way. I have a strange question. So just two questions real quick. So I just want to double check that the evaluated producer grant is no match required. I think I got conflicting information on that. I, I, from you. I don't think there's match required. Let me see. What did I put in here? Um, yeah, I don't think there's match required, but because it's competed nationally, it's recommended you find some match um, to get as many points as you can. Okay. Um, cause if you can show you've got some skin in the game, um, and you're going up against someone from, uh, Missouri, um, who's also got skin, in, who doesn't have skin in the game, you're probably going to get more points than the person from Missouri. Um, okay. so it, it helps. It's not necessarily required. Um, and it, it changes depending on, you know, right now that there's the funding opportunity, uh, live on the 16th changes every every time they come out with it sometimes they require it sometimes they don't um so hopefully that helps yeah i can email then, you the rest of my questions <laughs> oh yeah um and i mean we are more than able to sit here and go through them together um matching requirements oh interesting cost your match 100 percent of the grant amount required for all applications okay that conflicts i okay i need to get i need to get clarification on that and now my uh co-worker is telling me it's 50 percent match um <laughs> if you have questions about the value-added producer grant email me and i'll get you in touch with our value-added producer program Specialist. lead um, yeah. she knows everything about that program um thanks misty <laughs> um uh yeah don't you just That's love fine. government well, it's um, fine. You, yeah you said you were the energy specialist yeah yeah i can answer energy questions all day um but was there anything else i could do for y'all yes i would open up the floor to questions um i could pull it up Hey, this is this is Danny Walsh from the City of North Pole. Hey, um, uh, this is a this is a great pr presentation. Um, one of the things I, I had a question about is the energy audits themselves. Is there any support for? Uh, and again, we're a municipality, uh, but for the actual energy audits that you mentioned, that were kind of the gateway to some of the other opportunities. Right. Um, so, are you looking for energy audits for municipal facilities or? you know, for businesses within the city? Well, for, uh, in our lane, we would, we would think about uh, energy audit for like, if we wanted to put solar panels on a, a certain location, a certain municipal facility, uh, if we wanted to replace right. those through city hall, things like that. Uh, but if we needed that energy audit, because okay. I don't know how much that costs, um, but is, is there any, is there any support that you know of for, for those types of initial efforts? Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, um, the REAP grants won't be able to help you uh, with that because they're for for-profit businesses or ag producers. Um, but 
Um, I think uh, Department of Energy has uh, it's the Buildings Rise competition uh, through it's their SCEP office, S C E P, um, and that I think it's a it's a competition. So DOE loves their competitions. Um, so you would put in for it, and you won't be finding out until you get funding till you know a little bit later on. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, I would. I would suggest that even if you can't get energy audits grant funded, especially if you have an older facility, they're worth it. Um, you know, they're relatively low cost. Uh, you know, they might run you for a bigger facility or a bigger bunch of facilities. They might run you in the ten to twenty thousand uh, dollars for the big facilities. Um, but then within that, they'll have you know, especially if it's an older facility. Um, there would be every possible energy saving methodology you could conceive of everything from thermostats, changing out blower motors in your air handlers, um, new windows, new doors, weather, weatherization and insulation, swapping out internal and exterior lighting is a big one. Um, even if you, if you have vending machines, putting motion sensors on them. Uh, so when you walk by them, you know, the lights come on and then they turn off, um, you know, just all these little tiny things that, you know, if you've heard the term death by a thousand cuts, um, it just all adds up. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, there is kind of a bottleneck of energy auditors. Um, but that being said, once you're able to get an energy audit um, and you identify what those energy saving measures might be, I think Alaska Energy Authority, um, they're getting ready to redo the it's the REVEEP program. It used to be just VEEP, Village Energy Efficiency Program. Uh, but now they added the RE with Renewable Energy and Village Energy Efficiency Program. Um, and that is geared towards municipalities and tribes in rural Alaska. Um, and again, that's through Alaska Energy Authority. They're the state office. Um, I'm not sure when that's going to be rolling out. I think that'll probably be... Um, probably early summer, late spring, somewhere in there. So I have um, two questions or perhaps a, a comment, then a couple questions. Um, so on the business end, and that's, a, that's a really great question regarding the cost of the audit itself. It couldn't just be rolled into the total project cost. It you know, just like on the labor. Program. Yeah, it, it depends on the program. For the REAP so, grants, yeah. we would not be able to do that. Ah, um, okay. And honestly, in most programs, they're going to want to see the energy audit done beforehand because it that kind of informs your scope. Okay. Um, you know, because if the energy audit is to say, oh, yeah, you guys need three new windows, but this fourth window, it's okay. It's fine. You just, you know, kid hit it with a baseball last year and you replaced it. It's brand new. It's fine. Um, so that's, that's what will kind of inform the scope. And then the scope will drive the grant program from there. Okay. I have a strange question. Is there at any level where you don't need an audit or an assessment period, or is it anything under 80 K you need one period, even if it's like $5? Uh, well, if it was $5, we wouldn't fund it. Um, the, there is a, there's a floor. Um, the floor is like 1,500. Um, but even then you still need to have, you know, if it's under 80,000, it's gotta be an energy assessment. Um, however, if it's a really small project at that point, um, like let's say you're doing a window replacement project and it's going to be 20 grand all in and you're only doing the windows some of the vendors might be able to provide that kind of information. Um, you know, or like, let's say you wanted to do a boiler replacement project. Um, you know, some of the vendors might say, oh yeah, we've got this new boiler. Um, it's more energy efficient. Here's how it stacks up. Um, and if you tell them what you currently have, they might be able to um, just do a quick back of the napkin kind of analysis and say, well, here's what you're currently using with this new boiler. We're going to sell you, you'll save this much energy per year. Um, you know, and it's in their interest, it's in the vendor's interest uh, 
to make it look more appealing, you know, so we have to take it with a grain of salt and we might ask you for, you know, Hey, can you find an engineer to just sign off on this? Um, you know, just double check the math. Um, you know, what we're looking for is a third party verification. Um, you know, just make sure that there's no like cronyism or like, Oh yeah, my buddy, he's a insulation contractor. He'll, you know, tell me anything I need to hear to get grant funding. Um, you know, we're just looking for that neutral third-party verification. So I have a question regarding stacking or pairing. So it is possible mm -hmm. that say you wanted to, you had a facility and you wanted a, to add solar panels, but also to fur it out, which would be the energy efficiency component. You Would these be two separate applications and you're allowed to do that? Are you allowed to do that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and that term stacking, I'm gonna talk more about that later. Um, but so what we're able to do is each business entity can apply for one energy efficiency grant and one renewable energy grant per fiscal year. So let's say in year one, you want to get new insulation and a new boiler and solar panels. You could do two grants. You could do one for the insulation and boiler, and then you could do one for the solar panels. And let's say business is booming, you're doing great, um, but now you need to use more electricity because you're doing so well. So you come back next year, you want more solar panels. You can apply for more solar panels. However, because we gave you a grant last year, we're gonna note that when we're scoring. And if we if we hit our allotment, you know, our state allocation of 1.25 million, um, you're going to be scoring a little bit lower in the stack because you received a previous grant. I hope that doesn't discourage you from applying because um, even if we are not able to fund you at the state level, um, you know, I was saying whatever funding we don't use gets swept back to national office. We take your grant application and we compete it nationwide. Uh, so if we run out of funding at the state office, I guess uh, Utah doesn't want to do anything with renewable energy. So they weren't doing anything and they sent all their funding back to national office. You would compete for some of that Utah money. Hmm. Um, so the funds get swept, but your application gets up forwarded as well. Right, right. And we'll, we will retain your application for up to three quarters oh. um, under the current funding structure, that is. Um, after after uh, 930, um, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, something will happen. We just don't know what. Um, we're probably going to keep this REAP program around. Uh, it's been widely accepted uh, and pretty popular nationwide. So it, it's probably going to stick around. Um, and then coming back to your that word stacking, um, it's come up with uh, like the renewable energy tax credits through the IRS. Those are from the Treasury Department, and you know they're going to do their own thing. Um, but I do want to point out, so let's say your business wants to get solar panels put in. Um, you would apply to us. Let's say you get approved. Okay, great. You move forward with construction. You build the solar panels. Um, you send us in your paperwork. We reimburse you for half the cost. Now you have solar panels on your business you can then apply for the tax credits to do, I think it's up to 30% in some cases for that other 30%. And it's still eligible, even though it was partially grant funded. So at the end of the day, at the bottom of the ledger, uh, it should come out if you've got 50% from REAP, 30% from tax credits, you should be only paying 20% for your uh, solar installation if you do the tax credits as well as the REAP. Um, and that's all after the fact. Um, you're still going to have to front the cash because um, it comes in after the fact. But see, we made uh, we got Ken to take a note. See, that's good. Uh, <laughs> I do see here uh, right at the top. You got one hundred and forty four million. I'm, I'm thinking of you, Mike. And you say we got one hundred and forty four million set aside for underutilized technologies, not solar PV. Do we have an example yeah. of that? Is that something like uh, would heat pumps say? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'd have to double check on heat pump because that might be. Well, no, it's fine. That would be right under the, the top of your head. Side. 
Yeah. Uh, right off the top of my head, we're talking wind power, hydropower, geothermal is a big one. Um, yeah, heat pumps might actually fit under underutilized. Um, uh, but yeah, things like or biodiesel, uh, biogas, anaerobic digestion. Uh, those are all things that fit under the definition of renewable energy, but are just underutilized. Um, and I mean, over the last 10, 15 years, um, you know, the solar industry has just taken off. Um, and actually, I've been talking with some of the folks at the National Labs. Um, solar panels themselves, you know, each of these little modules on the solar array, they're getting to a point where they're becoming commodified. Um, so instead of like going and getting a solar array designed, you just pop over to Costco, pick up a couple, couple solar panels and pop it on the roof. Um, you know, they're getting to that level. They're not quite there, but they're really close. You know, I was in Costco last summer and I saw Coleman brand solar panels, you know, just a couple, couple Watts just for, you know, going camping. Um, but it's getting to a point where they're, you're not going to be asking the question, Oh, which solar panels should we get? You're going to be asking the question. Oh, hey, where can we pick up a solar panel? Hmm. Um, so they're they're not really solar is not underutilized, uh, but most everything else is like wind turbines, um, hydropower, hydrokinetics. Um, that is a distinction, believe it or not. Um, yeah, anaerobic digestion, tidal energy, wave energy, um, biomass, woody biomass would be a big one, uh, especially in the interior. So that would be something like maybe putting in a pellet stove? Yes. Yeah, and that yeah, that would be a renewable energy technology. Um, I know it is a uh, I think they changed their name, but is superior pellets are they still Still around? I know, still I, saw, I, know I don't know they that they're still their... in operation at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I know they sold their their fire logs down in Anchorage at one point. I saw them in Lowe's down here. Um, and I was excited to hear that. But um, um, yeah, and I actually think uh, Superior Pellet received our value-added producer grant once. Yeah. I'd have to double check on that. But I think they did receive it back in the day. I'll say up here, Aurora does pellets, but I don't think they're doing them this year just because they didn't have the guys to do logging, from my understanding. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but again, theoretically, but yeah. say it's a renewable fuel source. Right. Our air quality manager would not be happy to hear this discussion, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I am well aware of that conversation. And if I recall, wood pellet stoves depending on the stove may have better particulate emissions than some uh toyo stoves ah. um i I, uh, I cut wood. my teeth in rural energy doing biomass discussions um throughout the interior um i actually went out to minto when they got their cordwood boiler installed for the for the final inspection on that one well this has been great um so, so hey guys yeah. uh do you want to go ahead and stop sharing Dan? Yeah. Well, we are at the top of the hour. Um, I would open up the floor for any final questions uh, or comments. Anyone, anyone, any takers? All right. Well, uh, yeah, we've got a, a great presentation. Thank you, Mr. Smith. So, all right, everybody. So I would just remind, uh, I will go ahead and try to send some links. Uh, Mr. Smith is available to help us. But again, that's great information that right here in the community, Information Insights uh, is uh, can act as our, our support. Uh, yeah, can assist, yeah. can assist our local businesses tapping into this Again, rather, rather incredible opportunity. Sounds like we it is a bit time sensitive on the front end relative to getting applications in. It sounds like, again, we've, we've got the chance to uh, we've got secure funding through the yeah. September 30th application deadline. And you said two Correct. years for deployment of funds. Yes. So, yeah. If yeah I, if I've and... all the, oh, please go on, sir. March 31st. Oh, yeah. I, I just want to. You know, chime in again. Um, it's March 31st, June 30th, and September 30th. 
And then after that, I'm sure uh, the REAP program will continue to exist. We just don't know how lucrative of an opportunity it will be. Got it. And it sounds like actually that March 31st deadline for businesses that can can pull that off in the next month um, lines up very well with our actual build season. Again, if it takes you, you know, get yeah. your application in, takes a couple of months to make sure we've got the funding lined up and you've got all your paperwork in, but that would drop you right at the top of June. Yeah. You know? And that's right when, you know, construction takes off. So you're off that's to the right. races, uh, get stuff installed before the snow flies and, and then, uh, next winter we can do the back end paperwork because that's always the fun part right right <laughs> um, and then as far as yeah. prep for next year again if you manage to get your application in by june 30 or september 30 again you could you could get yourself all squared away and prepped up for a robust build season in 2025 with that secure 50 yes. percent you know match well, that's just great. Mr. Yes. Smith, thank you so much. Um, if you'll please tell State Director Nelica, uh, thank you for allowing us to have you, uh, for alerting us to this opportunity and allowing us to have you. It would be much appreciated. Of course. I'll pass it along. Thank you, everyone. It's thank been a pleasure. you. Thanks. Well, all right, all right everybody. Take care. Have a great uh, afternoon. Yeah, thank you. You too. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for uh, tuning in. And uh, I'm not sure what we might have next week. Of course, I'll let you know. But otherwise, just have a great rest of your day, a great rest of your week, and we'll see you again soon here at the Energy for All Alaska Task Force.